Any leftover questions about Ajahn Mani before we move on? Okay, we'll move on. In 1927, a law was passed in Thailand <coughs> requiring that all monks become grade school and high school teachers. Ajahn Mun left the Northeast and went into Northern Thailand, which was further away from Bangkok power. It was during this period that Ajahn Lee studied with him, first right before Ajahn Mun left, and then again Ajahn Lee followed him up to Chiang Mai. Ajahn Mun was staying in Chiang Mai in the year 1932. Word came that I mentioned to you that senior monk in Bangkok, who was an old childhood friend of his, passed away. And together with a word coming out from Bangkok that that monk had passed away were two other letters for John Mun. One was a letter giving him an ecclesiastical title and the other making him abbot of the monastery where he was staying in, in Chiang Mai. He left the next day, went further into the forest. It turned out that the, the monk who was the friend in the high places had a student who pretty much took over that monk's um, responsibilities in the Northeast. This monk was very much opposed to the forest tradition. He said, maybe with these good-for-nothing monks not settling down, teaching school like they ought to, um, it became quite a problem for the forest tradition. And John Mun did not return to the Northeast until, I said, early 1940s. He stayed on there until he died in 1949. It was at that point when the, the forest tradition, many of the monks in the forest tradition felt that they had lost all their protection. They didn't have friends in high places in Bangkok. They didn't have a John Mun to speak up for them. And it was at this point where John Lee started moving into Bangkok. He had been a student, as I said, with a John Mun since the early 1920s, late 1920s. Um, of a John Mun students, he was probably the most systematic in his writings. Instead of just giving Dharma talks, he also actually sat down and wrote books explaining the Dharma. Many of his books, you got books back there, basic themes, craft of the heart. They read a little dry, and what the reason behind that was because this was a period, as I said, when new textbooks were coming out from Bangkok. And the textbooks, especially on Dharma, tend to read like laundry lists. You know, they're the five this, the seven that, and the eight this, and the nine that, without much explanation. And John Lee was going back and sort of taking those lists and filling them in with explanations based on the experiences of the forest monks. So it has kind of a dry form, but there's a lot of stuff from his practice and John Mun's practice the John Munn style of teaching in these books and the way they explain various concepts. Some of the points that he would make were very similar to John Munn's, that there's not that clear a distinction between virtue, concentration, and discernment, um, the active role of the mind. You see this not only in specific things that he says, but also the way he organizes his books. And this is what I think really sets a John Lee apart in the tradition. He has an extremely organized mind. And the way he would organize a book would be to make points. Like in, in, he has a book described in the Eightfold Path, and he ends with a discussion of virtue, concentration, and discernment. And in the discussion of each of those three topics, he brings in the other two to make the point that you know, they're really not that clearly, clearly demarcated. His book on the establishing of mindfulness, which I translated to frame, as frames of reference, he does divide the book into the you know, four different frames of reference, body, feelings, mind, mental, mental qualities. But the theme that runs throughout the book is the three qualities you bring to the practice, ardency, alertness, and mindfulness. Those, that's the main theme of the book. And he develops that all the way through. We'll talk about, and we'll go into that a little bit more in detail in a minute. But when you want to understand a John Lee, you have to look at not only what he has to say, but also how he organizes his thoughts because that can tell you a lot about some of the messages you're trying to get across. Now, John Lee was, did not sit for the exams. He, he did not learn Pali. He was something of an autodidact. This was during a time when, it, it's hard for us to believe this, but in Thailand it had Buddhism for many hundreds of years. It wasn't until 1956 that they had a Thai version of the canon, printed with all translations. They started working on that in the late 1920s. It took them until 1956 to finish it. While they were working on that, they came out with a little magazine called the Dhamma Chaksu, or Dharma Ai, in which translations of suttas were being, as they were being done, they were being printed and sent out to the country. 
John Fuhrung was staying with the John Lee at this time. He said they'd receive their monthly edition and sometimes during the evening sit, which for them was from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. or sometime to midnight. And John Lee would pull out the latest issue of Dhamma Jackson and just read it to them. And so they were getting a lot of the latest translations of the suttas coming in. What's interesting is that um, even though John Lee did a lot of work on the topic of breath meditation, there was no place where he discusses the Anapanasati Sutta, you know, the 16 steps. I always like to wonder what it would have been like if he had had access to that, how he would have explained the 16 steps. However, in addition to his organized mind and his attempts at learning more about the suttas, extremely strong powers of concentration and he was reputed to have all kinds of psychic powers. In fact, towards the end of his life, as John Fuhrman said, there was only one power he didn't have and he couldn't levitate. <laughs> he had everything else. He could make other people levitate. Um, watch out. Once you start talking about a little John Lee, it's hard not to get into the psychic powers because they're so much fun. Um, with levity, yes. Well, that's a lot of the, my favorite stories are the ones that are levitous, I guess you call them. I don't know. Um, and John Fuhrman told the story about one time when he was with a John Lee in Ayutthaya. This is the old capital of Thailand, and they had, at that point, that point, the old palace was just in ruins, and it hadn't been developed into the national park that it is now. It's just kind of an old place out and out and abandoned. And they had these large trees. They're called putsa in Thai. It's kind of like a small apple about yay big. And the trees have these Im immense spreading branches that go off in all directions. And the group of the monks had gone, and usually when monks would go out on a trip like that, they'd take a couple of little kids along who would help you know, fix the rice and do other chores for the monks. And so they had this one kid named Manun, who was about 11, 12 years old. So one night they're going to sit and meditate, and John Lee says, okay, we're going to make you levitate. And John Fung said to himself, it's not us who's going to make him levitate, you're going to make him levitate. Mm -hmm. So the monks sat in a circle, and had Manun sitting in the middle. And they hung a rope down from the branch, and he said, no, if you find yourself rising up to the ground, and it scares you, just hang on to the rope so you don't fall. So. They're sitting and meditating, sure enough, he was you know, three or four feet off the ground before he realized what was happening. And when he realized what was happening, he was so scared he forgot about the rope and just boom, fell down. And as John Fung said, he couldn't sit down for the next couple of days after that. Um, there's another story that John Fung didn't tell me, but it does concern him. I heard it through someone who had learned it from John Mahabua, that apparently John Fung had told him. Um, another night, again, it was the same sort of situation. The monks were sitting in a circle. And John Fu noticed that first the monk next to John Lee was rising up off the ground, coming back down. Then the next monk, off the ground, back down, and around the circle. And John Fu was over here. He said, okay, I'm not going to let him lift me. <laughs> <laughs> and so the monk next to him was going up, down. And he was sitting there. So he, as, as he said, he thought of himself being rooted down in the ground, like his spine just went down in the ground, deep, 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 and he just thought of earth element. He felt this force <laughs> coming up from underneath. <laughs> he moved around a little bit, but nope, nope, nope. And it stopped. And then the monk next to him, up, down. And at the end of the sit, and John Lee turned to him and said, Stubborn? <laughs> <laughs> However, my absolute favorite story about a John Lee's psychic powers, well, I've got two more to tell you. One I'll tell you later. Um, group of army men. This is when John Lee was, had a monastery just outside of Bangkok. A lot of army officers came to see him, and they liked to hear stories about his adventures out in the forest, and because they were, you know, they were army men, they'd been out in the forest too. And they said, gee, we want to go out with you next time. And he said, look, you're old now, you've got paunches, you're not in the shape that you used to be when you were young soldiers, and I don't think you can handle it. Oh yeah, we can handle it, we're soldiers at heart. And so he said, okay, we go out, but you spend just one night with me in the forest, and then you come back out, and I'll go deeper in. So that was the agreement. So they take the train up to La Brittany, get off and start going into the forest. And sure enough, as the afternoon wears on, it's getting hot, they're getting tired, and they're beginning to complain. They're hot, they're hungry, thirsty. And at first John Lee didn't say anything, just kept walking, walking, walking. And then he finally said, so you see that ridge up there? Can we get to the top of the ridge? There'll be a banana grove. And we can stop there and you guys can have some bananas. And so they get up to the top of the ridge, and sure enough, there's the banana grove. So they cut some of the bananas off the trees, and the, the soldiers have some bananas. And then before they leave, John Lee says, no, look, you live in the forest, you cannot be messy. They've been scattering 
the peels all over the place. So you gather the peels into one little pile and take the machete that you used to cut the, the bananas and just stick it into the pile of banana peels. And tomorrow on your way back out, you'll pick up the machete and take it back with you. So they did as they were told. So that night they went in, spent the night in the forest. After the meal the next morning, they came back and they got to the ridge and there was no banana grove. So they looked around for the knife and it was in a pile, excuse me, it was a pile of shit. <laughs> And the being what did we eat yesterday? <laughs> <laughs> so when John Lee returned to the monastery, they all came to visit and bowed down. They apologized for causing him trouble. Um, so. <laughs> so, so John Lee was no ordinary person. Okay. Um, he was the first to bring the forest tradition into central Thailand. First he went to the town of Jandaburi, which is down on the southeast coast of, Bangkok, uh, southeast coast of Thailand. And then in the early 1950s, he started going to Bangkok. The student of that senior monk in Bangkok, by this time, had received the rank of Somdet. Now, Somdet is an extremely high rank. I mean, there are only six Somdets in Thailand at the time, and one of them would then be chosen to be the Supreme Patriarch. And he happened to be sick at the time, and so John Lee went and visited him and just sat in one corner of the room and just started spreading concentration power to the guy. And the monk said, what are you doing? And John, they said, I'm making a gift of stillness. And the old monk said, well, whatever it is, keep it up. It feels good. <laughs> <laughs> so every day, John, John Lee would go in. He'd sit in the corner. And, and as the old monk began to recover, they started talking about Dharma. John Lee started giving him instructions in meditation and basically converted the guy into a supporter of the forest tradition. Then John Lee was invited to stay on in Bangkok and to teach. Now, this, as I said, this was at a time when, by this time, a lot of those monks who had been devoting their lives to becoming teachers had been replaced in the schools by lay teachers who were, had been, had gone through you know, regular teacher training. And they're kind of finding themselves without a role in life. Still, though, they stuck to a lot of the old orthodoxy that had been taught by the Bangkok hierarchy, including the idea that jhana was impossible and nirvana was impossible in our day and age. It was a John Lee's duty, basically, to convince them otherwise. One of his ways of doing this, he had a number of lay people coming to study and meditate with him. And the particular monastery where he was, including this one woman whose job at the monastery was to clean the bathrooms. She would come and sit with him and meditate, and she got so she could read people's minds. You know, whether it's under her own power or John Lee's reflected power, or what I don't know. So, who does she, whose minds does she read? She reads the minds of the monks in the monastery, and then goes to report to the abbot. Say, do you know <laughs> what these monks are thinking? <laughs> yeah, this one is planning to take over after you die, and this one, I don't know about his, his precepts, and she just went down the line. Um, and so the abbot called the monks and said, you guys got to watch out. These people know you inside and out. Um, so put a little fear of the dharma <laughs> into the monks of Bangkok. Um, eventually, John Lee was given a piece of land outside of, outside of Bangkok. He developed it into a monastery and then in 1961 passed away. Um, what he left behind, as I said, was probably the most organized set of teachings that you get from the forest tradition in, in his books. Some of the basic themes that he discussed, again, as, as with the John Mun, he saw that the, the heart, mind, and in almost every Buddhist culture, they don't make a, sh a sharp distinction between heart and mind. They usually tend to use the same word or they use the two words interchangeably. This is the, it's primarily an active factor. We'll see this in the passage from Frames of Reference that we'll talk about in, when we get to the, the readings, where he talks about the mind flowing out to its objects. Um, and then your greed flows out to look for something to get greedy about. Anger goes flowing out to look for something to get angry about. Um, probably one of the most dominant metaphors that a John Lee used in his teaching was that the practice is a skill, and you develop it through trial and error. Um, discernment is not just a matter of learning about things, but you actually take that knowledge and you put it into practice to become more and more skillful. In the process of working on your skill, you gain more discernment. Um, and you see this both in his treatment of, ha of mindfulness practice and in his treatment of uh, concentration practice. Common theme in a lot of his Dharma talks. He says, learning how to meditate is learning like how to sew a pair of pants, learning how to weave a basket, learning how to make clay tiles, 
learning how to make things out of silver. You take the object and you do different things with it, and in the course of doing different things with it, you learn about the object. The object teaches you a skill, if you're observant. Learn how to read what you're doing, read the results of what you're getting, uh, you're getting from your actions. Um, another one of his metaphors that he'd like to use repeatedly is virtue as a metaphor for the concentrated mind. We'll have two passages on, on that. One which he takes the various hindrances and shows how each of the hindrance, hindrances corresponds to an action which is basically forbidden by the precepts. So you take the five, five precepts and you internalize them as you practice concentration. Like John Mun, he did not make a sharp distinction, be, distinction between mindfulness practice and concentration practice. You see this particularly in his treatment of mindfulness in that when he gets to mental qualities or the dhammas as the last, the last of the, four, the, the fourth uh, frame of reference, he talks quite a bit about jhana as being what you do as you're trying to develop sensitivity to mental qualities. In this discussion of Satipatthana, as I said, his emphasis is on the three qualities you bring to each of the frames of reference, ardency, alertness, mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness, and this, this fits in with the canon, and mindfulness in Thai is translated as a berluk, which is actually a, a quality of the memory. It's what you bring to mind as you're doing something in the present moment. So it's not just bare awareness of the present or full awareness of the present. It's actually bringing something that you've remembered from the past that you apply to what you're doing in the present moment. That's what mindfulness is. You look in the canon, the Buddha defines mindfulness as a faculty of memory. Okay. The second quality, ardency, excuse me, alertness, is when you're actually watching what you're doing and looking at the results you're getting. And finally, ardency is putting your whole art into trying to do it skillfully. What's interesting in John Lee's analysis of these three qualities, ardency, alertness, and mindfulness, of the three, ardency is his, you know, he describes ardency as the discernment factor in mindfulness practice. In most other traditions, you'll see the alertness part, is, it's usually translated as full comprehension or clear comprehension. And that's the, that's the discernment faculty. But for John Lee, it's your effort to do it skillfully. That's, that's the discernment. In other words, you realize that once you've learned about the Dharma, the wise part of you says, I've got to put this into practice. And I'm going to learn more about it by putting it into practice. That's where the wisdom comes in. Okay. And again, this is connected to this business of trial and error. You try out various things in your practice and learn from from your mistakes and learn from the times when you don't make mistakes. This connects to a teaching that's mentioned once in the canon. It's called three levels of discernment. There's discernment that comes from listening, discernment that comes from thinking, and then discernment that comes from development. Um, the word bhavana can also mean meditation. And in the course of you're trying to develop certain qualities in mind and there's discernment that comes from the activity of trying to develop them. It sharpens and heightens your discernment. In his treatment of the four frames of reference, he also makes the point that they're all four are there at the mind when it's concentrated on the breath. You've got the breath, which is the body. You've got the feelings that come from the way you are or working with the breath energy. You've got the mind state that is either with the breath or not with the breath. And then you've got the various mental qualities, either the hindrances or the factors for awakening or the, fa or the factors of jhana. These things are all present when you're focused on the breath. So the question isn't that you're not doing four different practices. You're doing one practice, set it on the breath, and then noticing which aspect of the practice needs to be brought into line. So you can shift frames of reference deliberately. When you say, okay, there's a problem here in the way I'm breathing, let's focus on the breath. Or there's a problem with the mind state that I'm bringing into it, let's we'll focus on the mind for a bit and bring that into line. So you've got all four frames of reference are right there. And when you're, when you're doing mindfulness practice, all four are present for you to work with. One of John Lee's most distinctive teachings is his treatment of breath meditation. This is a t the particular techniques that became associated with his name were developed after John Mun passed away. And John Lee took, a, took two trips to India, one in the 1930s, another in 1950. And in 1950, he went and actually spent quite a while there. 
And one of the questions that occurred to him was, you, know, you see these yogis you know, sitting all day under the sun, standing on one leg, lying on beds of nails. How do they do that? And being a John Lee, he didn't go up and ask them. <laughs> he went into meditation, asked the question in his meditation. And the answer that came out was, they're playing with the breath energy. And so he said, okay, they're using it for that purpose. Can we use the breath energy for other purposes? And so he started working with breath energies in, in his meditation. Came back to Thailand and wrote um, his method one in keeping the breath in mind. Several years after that, he went and spent a rains retreat deep in the jungle north of Chiang Mai. And as he tells the story, he, the spot where he went to, he had to walk three days through the jungle to get there. As soon as he arrived, the rains retreat began. And within a few days, he had a heart attack. Because here he is, you know, that many days away from any kind of medical treatment, what is he going to do? He started using the breath energies in his body. Worked that out. And after the three months were over, he was able to walk back out. And came back and wrote down method two, which is the method that he taught from that point on. As he worked with breath energies, he also um, formulated the ways in which working with the breath is related to the practice of jhana. And this is the first description in the forest tradition that really goes into detail in the, in the jhanas. And John Munn would mention them, he would talk about them, but there's nothing written down until John Lee worked on this. Um, probably the most original contribution that John Lee made to the descriptions of jhana are, one, in the case of getting into the first jhana, he divided you know, the five factors of jhana, the directed thought, evaluation, singleness of preoccupation, rapture, and ease. He listed the first three as the causal factors of the jhana. In other words, you, these are the things you do. You, get, you direct your thought to the, practice, to the topic, you evaluate it. Like in the case of the breath, you worry, is the breath comfortable, is the breath not comfortable? Once it's comfortable, what do you do with that sense of comfort to get the most out of it? You spread it through the body. You allow it to spread. And that, that's important. I, I learned that from the hard way. You allow it to spread. <laughs> you don't force it through. And then as you get more and more absorbed in doing this, the mind comes to its singleness of preoccupation. And the result will be the, uh, the rapture, which is a, it can't be anything from a sense of fullness to your hair standing on end, sort of more gentler or more um, St. Teresa-like manifestations. And so that was his first really interesting, you know, original contribution to the analysis of John. And the second was the evaluation is the discernment factor in getting the mind into concentration. That you're actually trying to analyze what's working, what's not working. This relates directly to the practice, is what he had taught about ardency. You're ardent about doing it well. And, and you see some descriptions of John when they talk about evaluation as being this kind of unfortunate, wobbly nature of the mind. And John Lee says, look, it's really necessary. If you're going to work, get to settle down in the body, you've got to work through. And basically, it's kind of like cleaning off your bed sheet. And if you've got bugs and dirt and everything on your bed sheet, you don't want to lie down. You clean it off first. You've got everything kind of straightened out inside. Then the mind can settle down and really be solidly with the object. And so if you really want to settle down in your body, have a full body awareness and have a sense of being ease, have a sense of ease being there, you've got to work through the breath energy disturbances kind of get them straightened out. As for his teachings on discernment, um, again, his, his approach being that this, this practice is a skill, he talked about the strategic role of the different teachings. First is that there's a the teaching on becoming. Now becoming bhava is part of the Buddha's analysis of suffering and the cause of suffering. And wherever any craving that leads to bhava or becoming is going to be a craving that leads to suffering. Now the word becoming here basically means a sense of identity taken in a particular world of experience. Now this can happen on different levels. Like on, like on, the, on the large level, as human beings here right now, we are all human beings on the level of the human realm. So we've taken on that identity within this particular world. It, within the mind, there's also states of becoming, and this is when you see yourself in a particular place, it starts out with a, a desire, so you suddenly have a desire for chocolate. 
and you know that down at the Safeway they've got really good dark chocolate. And you're thinking to yourself, how do I get down to the Safeway? Can I get down to the Safeway? Do I have enough money? Okay. So that particular world of experiences right now is Safeway and anything that either helps you get to Safeway or things that get in the way of your getting to Safeway. That's the relevant world of experience. And then your identity in that is, okay, on the one hand, I want to consume that chocolate, and two, I have the ability to buy it. That's me in that particular <coughs> state of becoming. And so, okay, suppose you've gone down and you've got the chocolate, you've dropped that desire, and then what's your next desire? And you replace that with another becoming. And then another, and then another, and another. And as the Buddha pointed out, these states of becoming that we take on in the mind, there's suffering there in the creation of the state and trying to maintain it. There's that great Far Side cartoon where you know, atomic war is happening and people are running around the city with it, you know, crazy. And you see the bombs going off in the distance and everybody running around. And there's this car that stopped at the red light. And there's a, there's a dog in the car. And there's another dog on the sidewalk. And that's caption is, finally Fido saw something that attracted his attention. <laughs> The relevant becoming for those dogs was, where are the other dogs in this? In this? Um, so as John Lee explains it, when you get the mind in a state of concentration, that is a state of becoming. So we're using becoming for the purpose of getting beyond becoming. Can you use it strategically? You get to know, and as he will get to the passage where he talks about this, you get to know this through making it, giving rise to it, so you get really, really clear on what are the steps and that the mind creates a state of becoming for itself. And at the same time, this, because it is a still, centered, solid state of becoming, it allows you to see other states of becoming as they move. And you, can, you have something to compare them with. Okay, this is less stressful than some of those other becomings. That's one of his teachings on discernment. The other one is his way of dealing with the three characteristics. He talks about the practice of concentration as fighting against the three characteristics of inconstancy, stress, and not self. In other words, you try to create a state of mind that is constant, easeful, and under your control. And it's by pushing against those three characteristics you, you realize how far you can push and how far they start pushing back. So you don't just give up and say, okay, everything is inconstant, stressful, not self, what next? So let's push against it. Make the mind still. Make the mind easeful. Try to get this under your control. He says, in the, in the course of that, you will have a sense of, when you, when you see both sides, okay, how far you can push against these things, ultimately you're going to let, let go of both sides. But first you've got to push against them. Also, he has very, very clear teaching on um, the difference between no self and not self. I stole all my good ideas from a John Lee. <laughs> <laughs> He rejects the idea that the Buddha taught there was no self. He does say that okay, there, there's not self is used as a as a step in the practice, but then you have to abandon that as well. Both sides eventually get dropped. Both the sides that you might identify as easeful, constant, and under your control, and the things that are inconstant, stressful, and not under your control. Eventually, you're going to let go of both. But in order to understand them, you have to be able to develop both, and work with both. So those are some of John Lee's main teachings. Do you have any questions before we start going on the, on the readings? Okay. So was it easeful, calm, or constant? Easeful, constant, and under your control. Okay. Because when the Buddha is talking about self and not self, it's an issue of control. He says, you know, if you can't control something, how can you claim it to be, your, to be yourself? So in this case, you're getting the mind more and more under your control. You see how far you can push it. If they didn't have any, pal they didn't have the, didn't have the canon, even in Thai, <laughs> and they didn't know Pali, what did what did they do? Was it just an oral tradition of, there was of oral the tradition ideas? Of people would translate of the suttas themselves, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Oral. Yeah. And what they did have was, but they did have, they'd have translated. You know, they have they had books on. You know, giving the various chants that were done, which included quite a few of the sutras. And those, some of those will be translated. So they have, you know, some of the basic, the basic teachings were translated, but just the whole canon as 
one entire set of books was not available in Thai. The, the Dika reciters and the Majima reciters and the things like that. You know, I hear of people in Burma who've memorized large chunks of the canon, but I've never heard of that in Thailand recently. Yes. Question in the back. So I'd like to go back to, to um, the chocolate at Safeway. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I can see one way to work with it would be to um, just come back into the present and uh, work with the breath energy mm-hmm. and kind of undo or push against that. Mm-hmm. And then another thing I could do is go ahead and go to Safeway, but um, try to cultivate my mindfulness every step of the way. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Well, chocolate's not that big a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not for you. <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 But I suppose you feel tempted to cheat on your husband. You don't cultivate mindfulness every step of the way. <laughs> you say, look, I've got to do something about this desire. I, I mean, if I'm fantasizing about this, there's something really wrong with that. I could get into a lot of trouble down the line. So I've got to stop and go back and ask myself, one, find another state of becoming that's giving me a sense of well-being right now. And that's one of the purposes of concentration practice, is to give you that much kind of a leg up on the fact that you're not so hungry for whatever comes into your mind. And then from that point of view, then you can start looking at the desire that's behind this state of becoming. And ask yourself, what's the appeal? What do I think I'll actually gain from this? Now, a lot of times we go out after these things because we really are hungry. And then, but you, when you begin to satisfy the, this hunger for some sense of pleasure inside, which is what the concentration accomplishes, then you can look at, well, what am I really getting out of this? And then you compare that with what are the drawbacks? Then you begin to realize, okay, I can see that the drawbacks would take me to a place I really don't want to go. But you're not going to be able to let go of it really in, until you really, really understand what's the allure, what pulls you there. So part of you can say, okay, I know this is bad for me, I'm going to let it go for that purpose. But something might bring it up again, which means you have to go back and look at it again, and then again, and then again, until you finally realize, okay, this is what I thought I was going to get out of that, or this is what I was getting out of even thinking that those thoughts. And the second thing is, as I pointed out, there's, there's two sides to the you in this world of experience. There's the side that wants to consume that pleasure, and there's the, the side that feels, I have the power to produce it. Or if I don't yet have that power, I want to develop that power. Like if there's something you want to buy, I don't have the money yet, but I can think of how ways I can get the money in order to buy that thing. And so you have to look at both sides. What, what pleasure do I get out of being that producer? And what pleasure do I get out of being a consumer? Are they worth it? Thank you. <laughs> Question here? Where's the nearest mic? So you're, you were talking about... Um, Ajahn Lee and uh, clearing out disturbances in the body, mm-hmm. in the, the breath energies. Um, can you relate that to like the mental thoughts? Are, are there, is there some connection with that? And is he then weighting the energies in the body versus just the random thoughts that are coming and going in the head? Or one, how? one of the things you find as you get more sensitive to the breath energies in the body is that when you think a continued thought, the mind has this tendency to tense up a little part of the body. That's kind of a marker, so you can keep that thought in mind. And if you want to put the thought out of mind, you just release that. When you find the marker, you release that tension. And then the fact that if you've got everything flowing really well, then the mind's tendency is just going to grab onto this, grab onto that, gets a lot less. So that we can actually be seeding our memories like in practicing Dhamma, mm-hmm. seeding the memories so that what does come up in the mind, which memory is like past seeded mm-hmm. into the present, mm-hmm. is skillful then. Okay, and you, you have the choice. Am I going to follow this thought? Is it worth following? I mean, one of the first things you do is you, whatever comes up in the mind, you say, no, 
skillful, unskillful, and if you want to get to the point where you can just say, really say no, and then let it go. And then you can start asking yourself, okay, which thoughts are skillful to follow and which ones are not skillful to follow? You have the choice of being more in control of these processes. So either, either way, at the end of the path, skillful or not, mm -hmm. is what you're needing to, to, to drop. But until that point, seeding the mind with skillfulness, yeah, that's, that's this, a good thing. Mm -hmm. This continually manifesting and developing yeah, well, more skillfulness. The fact that you're developing concentration, developing mindfulness, that's skillfulness right there. Skillful qualities. Which will seed future. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does he directly relate that? That if you, as the mind attends to the skillful, it will have a tendency to, say, block unskillful past there, there tendencies? There's a couple of where he mentions that, yeah. He says the problem is it's like, you know, as long as you've got something skillful in the mind, it's very difficult to, for unskillful thoughts to take hold. But the problem is that our mindfulness tends to lapse. And he says it's like a, a, a crow waiting for you out, out on, the, on the, the banister of the stairway out there. As soon as you walk out of the Dharma Hall, whoop, whoop, it lands on you. It's taken over. So it's really that continuity. It's trying to maintain the continuity. And after a while, it's not just the continuity. You want to have some discernment into these things. So as soon as they come, you recognize them for what they are. And say, I've been here before. I don't need to do this again. It kind of loses its appeal. It's like you know, figuring out tic-tac-toe. Once you figure out, okay, never put the first X in that in the box to the right, you know. <laughs> and once you figure it out, it loses its appeal. I mean, do you, do you play tic-tac-toe anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, like the difficulty is the Safeway chocolate is the the issues are very complex to grab our attention mm -hmm. when we think, oh, this is really important. You know, I'll, I'll meditate later, or I've got to think about this now in my meditation because it's really important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the um, subtleties of strength mm -hmm. for what's really important can be seems this to be why more and more difficult. Sort of rule for yourself when you're sitting in meditation is no matter what thought comes up, no. That, that clears up a lot of garbage. Because <laughs> otherwise you can go down all the long list of all the brands, chocolate they have over there. And so it's, mm, and maybe Safeway isn't so good after all. Maybe there's something better, you know. You know yeah. Down in the, the, the chocolate soldier down in Laguna Beach, they really got good chocolate. Maybe you should go down there. You know? okay. Okay. So ultimately, Ajahn Lee, I think, is saying that the pleasantness and I think your teachings, the pleasantness of the breath will really supersede. It gives you a better most. vantage point. And it's not a guarantee. I mean, you can still lose your concentration or you can still be nicely concentrated. And there's this part of the mind that says, why can't I have them both? I want the concentration and the chocolate, you know. <laughs> He's disagreeing. <laughs> Everybody's shaking their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of the allure and the downside, and the rising and the falling and the escape. It's not like the Maga. Is that what? That it's is? actually in the canon. Is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Figuring out and training yourself with the escape mechanism so that you have a. Okay, the escape is learning how to have dispassion for the allure. Huh. How do you develop that? Partly by looking at the drawbacks, mainly by looking at the drawbacks. And by doing it again and again, so it becomes mm -hmm. like an yeah. automatic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the back. The, the, the pleasure that comes when um, I'm playing with the breath and, and it's filling, and it just, it, it almost is like a power that starts to run itself in a way. It's like an engine, and, and I'm curious about how much to give yourself to that or to allow it to feel like because I've always heard that jhana is a good thing don't if you're going to munch on anything munch on jhana right? Mm, right so is it okay just to really go with it I mean because it go with feels it. I mean, so good fortunately, fortunately it doesn't cause indigestion right <laughs> and there will come a point where you get we have enough you feel like you had enough of that 
you know, you know if you've been have a busy work week and, and, and you feel you really need the recharging, just go for it. And there will come a point where the mind says, you know, I've really had enough of this. This is beginning to feel gross. I'd like something more refined. And that's when you go into, you know, you can kind of figure out, okay, what would a more refined state of stillness be where I'm not getting all this energy churning up all the time? And then it's kind of, it's kind of like tuning your radio into a different frequency or flying below the radar. Those are the two analogies that come to my mind. So how, do, how, do you, how does it tone, how do you get to that, 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 how do you allow that next refined state, like, without, because I don't want to push away the, the energy, it's, it's no, you're nice. Just, you, it, you're, I said it's a nice energy, but there comes a point where you feel you've had enough. You allow that to be there, but you say, I can bring my mind to a more refined level. And this is why I say it's like tuning into a different radio station. I mean, just think of all the different radio waves going through the air right here. You know, you've got the rock channel from you know, where, wherever, Oakland, and you've got the classical music channel, and you've got the easy listening channel, and you know, all, all these other things. And they're all going through the air here at the same time. And the question is, which one are you going to tune into? And it's not like you have to block out the other frequencies. It's just that you say, well, here's another more refined frequency. You go there. You mentioned that it's a good idea to develop both a sense of no self and of not self? No, not self and self. Oh. No self is not helpful. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Although not self kind of can lead to a conclusion of no self, but which is ever, experientially diffi difficult to right. differentiate. Well, it's, the difference is if you come up with a vision, there is no self. You get yourself tied up in all kinds of problems. If there is no self, why do you bother to practice? Yeah. Um, or if you say, I don't want to define what my self is, but I do want to develop a, sense, a healthy sense of self until I don't need it anymore. And this would, get, this would be in line with what they have in the canon, which is that you, know, you need to have, take yourself as your own mainstay. You need to love yourself and, and, and take, well, taking the self as a governing principle. You need a certain sense of belief in yourself that you can do this. All of these are healthy senses of self. Okay, so if we've had a weird experience of not self, or because of no self, I'm saying. well, okay, well, okay, well it was yeah. maybe my mind was interpreting it as yeah. not self, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. But do you just trust that there is a self, but you're just not understanding what it is yet? Well, ultimately, you get to the point where you don't care about that issue. <laughs> <laughs> the whole point is the Buddha says. He teaches selfing almost as if it's a verb. You do the selfing thing and you do the non-selfing thing. And the question is, when is it skillful to do the selfing? And what kind of selfing is skillful? And when is it more skillful to drop that? So selfing is a choice. It's a choice. And again, it's a question of when is it skillful, when is it not? And maybe identifying with skillful things is, is a choice. Is a choice. And there, there will come a point, though, when you say, OK, if, if, I don't need that anymore. I mean, as long as you feel a need for happiness, there's going to have to be a sense of self that can produce this and will consume it. When you've got a happiness that doesn't require any of that, then you can let it all go. This question here. Mm -hmm. Is selfing then the same as the, the becoming? Right. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so my experience has been like for, let's say, um, I have a good intention of doing good in the world, mm -hmm. but that in, intention is causing a sense of overwhelm uh, and also a lot of restlessness in the mind. Mm -hmm. So I know, I guess, the base intention of moving towards that action mm -hmm. seems good, mm -hmm. but it's still causing this restlessness. So how should I look into it? Okay, you have to ask yourself, well, first, the, the idea that you want to do good in the world, regard that as a type of generosity. And it would have said, when you're practicing generosity, you want to make sure that it doesn't harm you or harm anyone else. In other words, you're not giving of yourself so much that you have nothing left. And at the same time, you want to be doing it in such a way that it is actually helpful to the people around you. And you know, if you're going to be helping the world, the world is an awfully big place to help. You know, And so it's good to kind of you know, 
divide the job down into smaller jobs and say, okay, this is something I want to accomplish that is actually doable. And focus on that. Because otherwise you get it, you know, what it, I think Kurt Vonnegut called Samaritrophia. Samaritrophia, where you finally realize, I, I try to help the world, but it's also overwhelming, I can't help it, so you just stop trying. And that's not good. But you ask, you know, where can I give him my time, where can I give him my energy, my resources, where I feel that it would actually be developing good qualities in my mind and actually helping the people around me. Focus on that. Is there a, is there a mind state that I should be more aware of on kind of where okay, my if mind... if you find yourself, again, taking on too much and you find that it's frazzling and making you restless, you yes. okay, back up. Yeah, I'm trying too much. Okay, let's... Let's look at a John Lee. That first passage is about what life was like living with a John Lee. <clears throat> Some days he'd be cross with me saying I was messy, that I never put anything in the right place, but he'd never tell me what the right places were. Um, to be able to stay with him any length of time, you had to be very observant and very circumspect. You couldn't leave footprints on the floor, you couldn't make noise when you swallowed water or opened windows or doors. There had to be a science to everything you did, hanging out the robes, arranging bedding, everything. Otherwise, he'd drive you out, even in the middle of the rains. Even then, you just have to take it and try to use your powers of observation. This word of using your powers of observation, um, when I was staying with the John Fung, that was probably the word he used more than anything else in his meditation instructions. Basically, instructions on being alert. And then he would follow that up with being ingenious. In other words, you see a problem, try to figure out how to, how to solve it. Learn how to use your own resources. The next passage here goes into this principle of the mind as being an active principle. Okay. The word mind covers three aspects. The primal nature of the mind, mental states, mental states in interaction with their objects. The primal nature of the mind is a nature that simply knows. The current that thinks and streams out from knowing to various objects is a mental state. When this current connects with its objects and falls for them, it becomes a defilement, darkening dark the mind. This is a mental state in interaction. Mental states by themselves and in interaction, whether good or evil, have to rise, have to disband, have to dissolve away by their very nature. The source of both of these sorts of mental states is the primal nature of the mind, which neither rises nor disbands. It's a fixed phenomenon, always in place. The important point here is, as it gets further down, is says, even with that primal nature of the mind, that too has to be let go. The cessation of stress, or what I translated here as this disbanding of stress, comes at the moment when you're able to let go of all three. So it's not the case that you get to this state of knowing and then just say, oh, that's the awakened state. It's, it's something that you have to dig down a little bit deeper to see where your attachment is there as well. Any questions on that point? The next passage is from one of his Dharma talks. <coughs> this is about that analogy I said about developing a skill. What does discernment come from? You might compare it to learning to become a potter, a tailor, or a basket weaver. This is one of my favorite Dharma talks. The teacher will start out by telling you how to make a pot, sew a shirt, or a pair of pants, or weave different patterns. But the proportions and beauty of the object you make will have to depend on your own powers of observation. Suppose you weave a basket and then take a good look at its proportions. Okay, this is the ardency and the evaluation in, you know, at work. Okay. To see if it's too short or too tall. If it's too short, weave another one, a little taller, and then take a good look at it to see if there's anything that still needs improving. To see if it's too thin or too fat. Then weave another one, better looking than the last. Keep this up until you have one that's as beautiful and well proportioned as possible, one with nothing to criticize from any angle. This last basket you could take as your standard. You can now set yourself up in business. What you've done is to learn from your own actions. This is the discernment that comes from ardency, the discernment that comes from evaluation. As for your previous efforts, you needn't concern yourself with them any longer. Throw them out. This is a sense of discernment that arises of its own accord, an ingenuity and sense of judgment that come not from anything your teachers have taught you, but from observing and evaluating on your own the object that you yourself have made. And then he goes and makes it 
comparison with how dealing with the breath. You learn how to work with the breath energies in your body until they get comfortable. There's another Dharma talk where he talks about how the breath energies are like a mirror for the mind. You know, the breath energies start getting weird, okay, it's a sign there's something wrong with the mind. You back up and you try to get everything as smooth and worked out as possible. If you find yourself, as I said earlier, trying to force the breath too much, you'll tend to get headaches or a sense of imbalance in the energy in the body. Okay, that's a sign that you're trying to push things too hard. Again, you have to back up. So the breath is a good way of sort of looking indirectly at your mind. The purpose of all this is to get a very clear sense of what's the cause and what's the effect in the meditation. Because as he said someplace else, if you know the causes but without knowing effects, that doesn't count as discernment. If you know the effects without knowing the causes, that doesn't count as discernment. You have to see the, connects as, that the connection between the cause and the effect. That's the discernment, that's the discernment there. The next two passages deal with that analogy I talked about <clears throat> where he compares the precepts to what you're trying to accomplish in developing concentration. In the first paragraph, in the first passage, he draws parallels between the five precepts and the five hindrances. Ill will lies at the essence of killing, for it causes us to destroy our own goodness and that of others. And when our mind can kill off its, our own goodness, what's to keep us from killing other people and animals as well? Restlessness lies at the essence of taking what isn't given. This is one of my favorite ones. The mind wanders about taking hold of other people's affairs, sometimes they're good points, sometimes they're bad. To fasten onto their good points isn't too serious, for it can give us at least some nourishment. As long as we're going to steal other people's business and make it our own, we might as well take their silver and gold. Their bad points, though, are like trash they've thrown away, scraps and bones with nothing of any substance. And even, yet even so, we let the mind feed on them. When we know that other people are possessive of their bare points and guard them well, and yet we still take hold of these things to think about, it should be classed as a form of taking what isn't given. Isn't that great? <laughs> Sensual desires lie at the essence of sensual misconduct. The mind feels attraction for sensual objects, thoughts of past or future, sight, sound, smell, taste, tactile sensations, or for sensual defilements, passion, aversion, delusion, to the point where we forget ourselves. Mental states such as these can be said to overstep the bounds of propriety in sensual matters. Doubt lies at the essence of lying. Interesting comparison. In other words, our minds are unsure with nothing reliable or true to them. We have no firm principles and so drift along under the influence of all kinds of thoughts and preoccupations. Drowsiness is intoxication, discouragement, dullness, forgetfulness, with no mindfulness or restraint watching over the mind. This is what it means to be drugged or drunk. So what he's doing here is showing that there's a, there's a continuum. The practice of the precepts leads into the practice of concentration, and there are parallels that carry through. And you basically take the principles that you apply the skills that you've learned in observing the precepts and you bring those into your concentration practice, your concentration practice is bound, bound to go much better. The following passage takes that same theme and works it out in more detail. Like with the one in intoxication. Intoxication at the level of concentration refers to delusion and absent mindfulness, mindedness. If we're going to contemplate the body, feelings, mind, and mental qualities, our minds have to be still and really focused on these things. But if we're absent-minded and forgetful, our minds go down the wrong path, weaving in and out, back and forth like a drunkard. Does that sound familiar? Okay. Sometimes we end up falling down in a stupor and lying there on the side of the road. <laughs> John Lee, apparently ever known that at the monastery they would have all-night sits, and on every hour they would have a different monk get up and give a Dharma talk. And it was up to the monk whether he wanted to talk for the whole hour or just for part of the hour, but just kind of keep things going through the night. And a John Lee would always take the 3 a.m. shift, because that's the one where most people were getting really, really sleepy. And he would give some of his more entertaining Dharma talks. If you want to read a really entertaining Dharma talk, read the one on consciousnesses. 
It's in the book, um, Inner Strength, where he talks about how you think you're the only consciousness in your body? All the worms in your stomach have consciousness, all the germs in your blood have consciousness. A thought goes through your head. Maybe it's not your thought, maybe it's a germ's thought. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it, John, John Lee had, he had a great sense of humor, but according to John Fruing, it was very hard for anyone to get a John Lee to laugh. And that particular talk, the, the one in consciousnesses, which I think is really, really funny, total deadpan all the way through the time. This next passage deals with his treatment of the frames of reference. Dealing with the frames of reference, mere mindfulness isn't enough. When it's not enough, and yet you st still keep being mindful of the body, you will give rise only to feelings of pleasure and displeasure, because the duty of mindfulness is simply to keep remembering or referring to an object. So in developing the frames of reference, you, need, you have to know your tools for remembering. One, sati, mindfulness or powers of reference. Two, sampajana, alertness. This has to be firmly in place at the mind before sending mindfulness out to refer to its object, such as the body, and then you bring it back inwards to refer to the heart. In other words, you're watching the relationship between your mind and the object. And ardency is focused investigation, analyzing the object into its various aspects. Okay, this is the proactive part of the mindfulness practice. And then he gives the analogy. The body is like a sawmill, the mind is like a drive shaft. Alertness is the pulley that spins around the drive shaft in one spot. Mindfulness is the belt that ties the mind to its object, not letting it slip away to other objects. Ardency, focused investigation, is the saw blade that keeps cutting the logs into pieces so it can be of use. And this analogy then gets carried through the entire discussion of frames of reference. Any questions on that, that point? A point that came up, I was scanning through there, that, that this energy, the breath is the energy and the way you describe it, which apparently comes from there. And at one point he even says, the breath and the blood the chi and the shui, that's straight out of Chinese medicine, and going out through the fingertips and the three bony cavities, and uh, it was a relationship between Thailand and Chinese traditions. I mean, they, in Thai medicine, they do talk about breath energy in the body. Um, they don't have it quite as elaborate, you know, tradition as the Chinese do, and how the chi should be moving in your body. So with a lot of it, the John Lee, you know, when, he was, when you read Method 2, and you notice he has you start at the back of the neck and work down from there. And you know, people who have serious heart conditions you know, have, ten, have a lot of tension in the back of the neck. That's the place you start to relax things in the body. You read some of his later talks, instead of having the breath energy go down, he has the breath energy coming up the back of the spine. So you know, he's playing with the breath energy in different ways. And basically giving people the permission to play in different ways as well. But in terms of the relationship between Chinese medicine and Thai medicine, the, the, the two traditions are very different. The fingertips, the fingertips, the toe tips too. Yeah. That's an extremely important yeah. treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Most Thai medicine tends to trace its roots back to India as opposed to China. And in India, of course, they talk about the prana. And they, they talk about prana in, in India. But as I said, the Thai tradition of medicine, you go to a Thai doctor and you'll see a statue of Jiwaka, who is the Buddhist doctor. We're talking about traditional doctors. And there's a strong sense that Thai medicine is related to Indian medicine. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, because what I know about Indian medicine, they, use, they do things pretty differently. Like with Thai medicine, they say, okay, if there's a disease in your body, we're going to flush it out all right now. Uh, it tends to be a lot more drastic, say, than Chinese medicine. Oh, that's, that's the school of attacking first. Mm -hmm. It's just retired generally. Mm -hmm. 12th century. Mm -hmm. Get it out, yeah. yeah. Any questions? Yes, in the back. Mm, hello. I just I wanted to make a, a comment um, where you made that joke about having a worm's thought, and I yes. was just wondering if you if you knew that mo most of the or 
if that was based on the science, that most of the, the cells in your body are actually microbes. And there's research going into how those microbes affect your mental states. So it's all actually quite yeah. a scientific concept. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the whole talk is a talk on not-self. You know, just because the thought comes to your mind doesn't mean that you have to believe it or that you have to side with it or claim it as your own. Okay. The next passage is quite long. If we go into detail, we'll never get to the end of the passages today. Um, but I just want to make it, call your attention to a few things. One is, as I said earlier, the, the, John Lee is talking about directed, the evaluation here. How to get us let, let this comfortable breath sensation spread and coordinate with the other breath sensations in the body. Let them spread until they all merge. Once the body has been soothed by the breath feelings, the pain will grow calm. The body will be filled with good breath energy. The mind is focused exclusively on issues associated connected with the breath. Okay, those first three are the causes, and then the results, which are rapture and pleasure. But as he points out, when you go through the next, the remaining jhana, you stay with the breath. It's simply your relationship to the breath changes. It's not like you drop the breath and, and just go to the pleasure, or drop the breath and go to something. You stay with the breath, but your relationship gets... There comes a point when you realize that this evaluation of the breath can get the breath only so good. If you try to push it beyond that, you're not going to get anything better. So it's time to just put the evaluation aside and then just kind of merge with the breath. This is the point where the, your awareness and the breath become one. And you just stay there with that strong sense of fullness and ease. Until the sense of fullness begins to get unpleasant, the point we're making earlier, that you felt you've had enough. And then you tune into a more refined breath and a more refined sense of well-being. And it's at this point that the breath almost seems to stop. And then it actually stops in the fourth, fourth jhana. And in the following passage, he goes on to say, when you give rise to direct and thought and evaluation, you have both concentration and discernment. Directed thought and singleness of preoccupation fall under the heading of concentration, evaluation under the heading of discernment. And that, in turn, connects to the next passage where he's talking about how insight and tranquility have to go together. Any questions on any of those, any of those points? Is there, is there in, the, in this genre system an idea of a very definite shift of absorption? Like what I think you translated, fixed penetration from mm -hmm. Ajahn. Is there that idea, or do you just kind of float, you're not quite sure you're in jhana yet? You've got, well, it's, you can't, it, it doesn't have a signpost that says, now entering jhana, <laughs> population one, <laughs> elevation eight miles high. No. <laughs> You know that you're in a state of, it's, the first time you get into it, it it's a very gentle entering. And, but you, you come out and you realize, boy, that was really concentrated. And what you do is you put a post-it note on it. Uh, say, okay, this seems like something interesting, let's see if I can pursue it. And you do have to try to pursue it as a skill. And that means learning how to basically relate to the fact that you have a goal and learn how to approach the goal skillfully. Because sometimes you hear, well, you can't make it happen, so you just have to kind of sit there and wait for it to happen. We just have to, and there, there is a sense of you allowing, can. but you do learn how to direct it. You know, if I put the mind in this yeah. in this situation, I develop these qualities, it will tend to go. There's these people argue about it, but there's and there's a phrase in the, in the standard formula which is, uh, forget the poly, it's a, enter and abide in. Mm -hmm. That implies a definite change of enter and there abide are in. quantum <laughs> steps. Uh-huh. And you realize, okay, this is deeper than that. And sometimes you can realize, okay, it changed because I dropped that particular activity in the mind. Or well, like we were talking earlier about, you've had enough of the rapture, you've got to tune into something more refined. And the only really objective factor that can tell you you've reached any of the jhanas is when your breath really stops. And you can stay there long periods of time. Okay, that's fourth. 
and there's there's not there's no mental chatter going, just you're very present, very still. And there's a sense of you know, still breath energy filling the body. And you get there not by forcing the breath to stop or trying to stop it, but just by connecting all the breath channels in the body. So everything is so well connected that wherever there's a need for breath energy in the body, it goes from wherever there may be an excess without you having to think about it. It's like opening all the highways of San Francisco, totally removing all the cars. That means your car can go anywhere at once. You know? So there are stages now. But to get to know the stages, when you start, you, you kind of stumble into these things the first time that happens. But then after you come in and out, in and out, in and out, after all, you begin to recognize, oh, this is the landmark for this, this is what I do to get into that one. It's like the city manga. <laughs> now, the Vasudhi Manga, you have no, no concept of the world outside. But the John Lee, you can still know. I mean, there's, there, there's still sounds coming in from outside, but you're not paying any attention to them. But the, the skill of, of the, uh, looking at the first one, what's different, giving up this? That's as you're direction. developing more and more discernment around it. Absorption, you come out and you reflect on it, there's a possible absorption thing, and mm. aim in a different direction. That's mm. maybe it's just a cat. Yeah. Mm. I mean, in both cases, you're working on a skill. And this is how you work on a skill. You just do it again and again. You start learning how to observe what you're doing. Do you, uh, do you think uh, M111 is genuine? Sariputta is... Oh, Sariputta's ability to analyze ability. things. Yeah. Um, Sariputta was special. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> People think that is a case of, of mixing in later ideas with... I mean, it's useful to know that you can... In a state of con- it's it's like putting your hand into a glove. You can either be fully in the glove, you can be totally out of the glove, or you can be halfway in. And one of the skills that a John Fuang talked about, which he said he got from a John Lee, was this ability to lift your mind a little bit out of the concentration so you can observe it, but without pulling out entirely. And that requires a lot of skill, because for most of us, either we're in or we're out. Yeah, that's something like you're, you're in, in that state, but you can actually stand up. Mm-hmm. You're right there, go back in. You can go back in. Yeah. Oh, here's a new questioner. Yes. I think I'm a little confused with the, uh, um, the breath energy. You said mm-hmm. make the breath and energy into one, mm-hmm. because uh, all I know is the breath is going through my nose and through my lungs and mm-hmm. going up. Mm-hmm. Nothing from my feet or mm-hmm. hands. Or. Okay, well, when they're talking about breath energy, breath as air is one thing. Mm-hmm. Breath energy as your sense of, if you close your eyes, you know you have your body here. Mm-hmm. There's a sense of kind of a presence there. That presence is breath in this. Oh, yeah. okay. And so the question is, is there a sense of flow in that presence or does it feel tense or tight or imbalanced? Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yes. It should be a green light. Um, I was wondering about the relationship between, or if there is a relationship between the primal nature of the mind and the bottom. Okay, the primal nature of the mind is something that you would attain before. It's, it, it is something different. Because nirvana is not connected with anything, nothing flows out of nirvana. Where it's with this primal nature, it's, it's got the seeds for the flowing out. So there's still some defilements embedded in that primal nature. Okay. Pass the mic over here. I appreciate how um, easy you and Ajahn Lee make jhana seem. <laughs> I've been you. accused of teaching jhana light. Um, so <laughs> can, you, um, can you describe some of the... Um, the problems or the um, some of the blocks or the difficulties people will have in either getting to these jhanas or once they're in these jhanas and what the problems will be either like advancing on the next levels or coming in and out of these. Okay. Um, the main problem is greed, aversion, and delusion. <laughs> 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 um, Having trouble mastering a skill and having the right attitude towards the skill as you're working with it. Either pushing too hard and then getting discouraged, not pushing enough. Learning to focus your energies on, let's get the causes right and 
having faith that the results will come, instead of focusing all your desire on the results. Number one. Um, some people, as their minds begin to settle down, have visions very quickly, and that actually gets in the way of getting into deeper concentration. I mean, it's fun for a while, but then it, it's, you don't, if you don't let go of that, you can't get deeper. Now, this was a problem I noticed more in Thailand than I do here. Um, I think maybe a cultural thing, I don't know. Um, problems. Getting into a state of concentration and having a feeling that your body is out of balance, like really stiff or too lightheaded or too hot or too cold. And this is where analyzing things in terms of the properties is useful. You say, okay, if it feels too hot, I may be subconsciously focusing on the heat element. What can I do? I focus on the water element to balance it out. Or some people, when they get into concentration, find that they can't breathe. It's just the, body, it's just the effort to breathe feels you know, heavy, which is too much earth element. You focus on thinking that even the solid atoms in your body have a lot of space in them. Just hold that perception in mind, and that kind of loosens things up. So, so at this point, um, working with the uh, the elements mm -hmm. becomes really important yeah. mm -hmm. to be able to switch and balance out things. Right. And mm -hmm. so, they, so you're you're always working with just a um, a quieting and refinement and refining of mind at these states. You're refining and the mind and you are also trying to get a sense of, okay, when I do something, when something happens, what did I just do? Like there's a state changing your concentration, either for better or for worse, what did I just do? And are you going to note this through the body, through sensation, through any of the you'll four? Any, any, of the any, anything. Because what you... It, you know, it's not so much the question of which jhana are you in, or are you in jhana or not, but when you get the mind in a state of concentration, the first question is, can I maintain this? And then you try to maintain it. Then you begin to get, it's like riding a bicycle, the first couple of times you fall off. And some people say, well that means if I try to maintain something, if I have any effort, I shouldn't be making any effort, I just won't put any effort at all. That's the wrong conclusion. The wrong conclusion is, I, didn't, I wasn't observant enough. The right conclusion is, I wasn't observant enough. Let's go back and do it again. I notice where I'm getting off balance. And finally you develop a sense of balance. This is how I stay with that level of concentration. Once you're able to maintain it, then the next question is, is there still a sense of disturbance here? Is there something I'm doing that's unnecessary? Like with you know, the first jhana, you're, you're focused on one object, but you're, it's like keeping five balls in the air. Maybe we can drop two of those and still stay. And John Fuhrman's analogy was like you're setting concrete, and when you first set, when the concrete is first poured, you don't want to remove the form. So you really just keep doing whatever you're doing. But after all, when it's solid enough, you find I can remove the form, and it's still there. So with the direct of thought and evaluation, is what's keeping you in the first jhana, and you're afraid to let go of that because you immediately go off. Okay, but after all, you get so that okay, I can drop that and still just be. It's a, kind of a trial and error kind of thing. A question back there. I learned about jhana from Lee Brasington a lot, and he teaches it in terms of sensation mostly. Where is there some place that we can refer to your teachings about bringing the elements into that? Okay, um, there's a book with, with each and every breath. With each and every breath. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, also. Uh, he teaches that there are, not that I got there, eight jhanas, you know, and there are in the sutras. Do you teach about the other four? Yeah, no? you, that's... You got, the, you got the four jhanas and what I call the, the four formless states, which, you know, basically they come off of the fourth jhana. Because up, up to the fourth jhana, you basically, from the first to the fourth, you're with one object. It's just your relationship to the object changes. And then from the remaining ones, your object changes from space, you know, from, from the sense of having the form of the body to the space in and around the body to the awareness of that space, and sort of backing off in those ways. The focus changes. Actually, it's the perception that's holding you there changes. About the, um, the primal mind, right? Mm 
Mm-hmm. Uh, is that that uh, after the pari nibbana, the, the nibbana become the object of your mind, and it just stay with the. The mind doesn't have an object at that point. <laughs> so, uh, and I heard some explanation of uh, nibbana is is just an uh, is the object of the mind. That's why I would clarify it's a, it's that. It's an object as you're approaching it, but when you get into it, it there's no object. So then it's not awareness. But after uh, Prairie Nibbana, the, prim, the, the primal mind still exists, right? Well, there's, there's an awareness that exists, but they don't call it primal mind. When they're using primal mind here, it's, it's the mind from which things happen. And you have to get past that as well. Okay. The next passage is the conversation between the Somdet the one that John Lee was converting. Where he talks about getting the mind into concentration as being a form of becoming. First full paragraph on page nine. As I see it, I said, most students of the Dharma really misconstrue things. Whatever comes springing up, they try to cut it down and wipe it out. To me, this seems wrong. It's like people who eat eggs. Some people don't know what a chicken is like. This is ignorance. As soon as they get hold of an egg, they crack it open and eat it. But say they know how to incubate eggs. They get ten eggs, eat five of them, and incubate the rest. When the eggs are incubating, that's becoming. When the baby chicks come out of their shells, that's birth. If all five chicks survive, then as the years pass, it seems to me that person who had once had to buy eggs will start benefiting from his chickens. He'll have eggs to eat without having to pay for them. If there's more than he can eat, he can set himself in business selling them. And then he'll be able to release himself from poverty. <laughs> John Lee's analogies. So it is with practicing samadhi. If you're going to release yourself from becoming, you first have to live in becoming. If you're going to release yourself from birth, you'll have to know all about your own birth. In other words, you use the state of concentration to study the process of becoming, so you really understand it. And in the meantime, you learn, you feed yourself off the, the pleasure of the concentration, and that keeps you, keeps you going. The next passage is the one where the Buddha, he talks about the Buddha turning what was inconstant, stressful, and self, and not self, into what is constant, stressful, and self. And then let's, let's go on both sides. And then he got, in the following passage, he takes up the same themes. And he says, it lets go of the assumptions, and this is the word supposing again, that say that that's a self, that's not self, that's constant, that's inconstant, that arises, that doesn't arise. In fact, it lets go of, this is the point where letting go of the discernment that's gotten you that far. You can let go of these things completely, that's the Dhamma, and yet it doesn't hold on to the Dhamma, which is why we said that the Dhamma is not self. In other words, once you get to that point of full realization, even the perception that all things are not self, that passes away. It lets go of views, causes, and effects, and isn't attached to anything at all dealing with wordings or meanings, suppositions, or practices. This is release. He goes on to talk about how when you get to nirvana, you don't even need right view. Roads are built for people to walk on, but dogs and cats can walk on them as well. Sane people and crazy people will use the roads. They didn't build the roads for crazy people, but crazy people have every right to use them. <laughs> Don't you wish you knew a John Lee? <laughs> As for the precepts, even fools and idiots can observe them. The same with concentration. Crazy or sane, they can come and sit. In discernment, we all have the right to come and talk our heads off, but it's simply a question of being right or wrong. None of the valuables of the mundane world give any real pleasure. They're nothing but stress. They're good as far as the world is concerned, but Nibbana doesn't have any need for them. Right views and wrong views are an affair of the world. Nibbana doesn't have any right views or wrong views. For this reason, whatever is a wrong view, we should abandon. Whatever is a right view, we should develop until the day it can fall from our grasp. That is probably the most elegant statement of the path. I know. That's when we can be at our ease. And then finally, remember that passage where John Munn talks about all the different numbers up to zero and then you erase the numbers and just leave the zero? Okay. Here's a John Lee. 
To purify the heart, we have to disentangle our attachments to self, to the body, to mental phenomena, and to all objects that come passing into the senses. Keep the mind intent on concentration. Keep it one at all times. Don't let it become two, three, four, five, etc., because once you've made the mind one, it's easy to make it zero. Simply cut off the little head and pull the two ends together. <laughs> This works even better in Thai, because the Thai numerals, that the one is, has a little head, and it's like a little circle that almost makes it. We need to cut off the head and put the ends together, it's got a zero. But if you let the mind become many, making it zero is a long, difficult job. And another thing, if you put the zero after other numbers, they become 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, hundreds, thousands, on to infinity. But if you put the zeros first, even if you have 10,000 of them, they don't count. Isn't that a lovely image? So it is with the heart. Once we've turned it from one to zero and put the zero first, then it, other people can praise or criticize us as they like, but it won't count. Good doesn't count, bad doesn't count. This is something that can't be written, can't be read, that we can understand only for ourselves. When there's no more counting like this, the heart attains the purity and the highest happiness. As in the stanza, Nibbana is the ultimate happiness, emptiness, zero void, Nibbana is the ultimate ease. Any questions on any of those readings? So as you were talking about um, the jhanas, all I could think about was, but we don't crave it, we don't grasp it, we just practice the breath, mm -hmm. and if it comes, it comes? Well, the thing is, you have a few things you can do to help sort of make it easier for it to come. Um, one of the things that people tend to forget is when you're trying to practice, trying to develop the jhanas, the jhanas are not the object of your concentration. If you're sitting and thinking, when is the jhana come? When is the jhana going to come? When is the jhana going to come? You're pulling yourself away from the breath. You have to make yourself really interested in the breath and forget about the jhana for the time being. So I just really want to know what's going on with the breath energy in my body. And the fact that you get absorbed in that, that's how the jhana comes. So it's... it's the Buddha's not playing gotcha. <laughs> If you want jhana, you're not going to get it. Now that I <laughs> He's just saying that, okay, it's in the back of your mind, this is the road map. But in the meantime, when you're driving, you don't keep looking at the road map. You keep focused on the road. So the description is there. When you come out, you can ask yourself, does this fit in with the description? But when you're in, doing the concentration, you say, just want to know the breath. And work with that. And when you're asking the questions, you know, is this comfortable, is it not comfortable, is my relationship to the breath, does it need some adjustment, you're actually applying the questions of the Four Noble Truths, which is the beginning of discernment. So that's how you get the concentration and the discernment working together. Okay, let's take a short break. We're back here at three.